So I recently when I came across this blog post called The Invention of the Jump Shot by Jason Kotke. This intrigued me a bit as a former basketball player and coach. There was a time when somebody didn't jump off the ground to shoot the basketball. Again, my feet don't get too far off the ground when I shoot the basketball, but that's beside the point. So has anybody out there ever heard of Kenny Sailors? In 1942, Kenny Sailors, a guard at the University of Wyoming, dribbled down the basketball court at Madison Square Garden, got to the top of the key, left his feet, and drained a one-handed jump shot. People there that day looked at each other in amazement. They had never seen anything like it before. Current University of Wyoming coach Larry Shiat described that as the shot that changed everything. But why? Why would a young man who grew up in rural Wyoming decide that he had to all of a sudden start leaving his feet to shoot the basketball? Well, it's definitely one of those cases where necessity was the mother of invention. You see, Kenny Sailors grew up with an older brother named Bud who was six foot five. As an older brother will do, Bud took every opportunity he had to swat that ball back in his little brother's face who was standing just 5'8 at the time as a 13-year-old. So Kenny decided he was going to need to try something drastic. He decided he's going to drivel up to his brother. Just before he gets to him, he's going to leave both feet. And he's going to shoot the ball with one hand at the top of his jump to try to solve this problem of having the ball come back in his face every time. The most interesting part of this story to me is not whether that ball went in or not. It's Bud's reaction to his little brother Kenny trying something different. He said to his little brother after he took that shot, Kenny, that's a good shot. You should develop that. The jump shot didn't take off overnight. In fact, in 1963, 20 years after that shot at Madison Square Garden, Bob Cousy, who some of you may have heard of, some people called him the Houdini of the hardwood back in his day in 1963 when he retired as one of the all-time great guards in basketball history. He said just prior to his last game, the jump shot's the worst thing to happen to basketball in the last 10 years. Bob Cousy, the Houdini of the hardwood, who was known for dribbling behind his back and making behind-the-back passes, couldn't see the innovative nature of this jump shot. So this got me to thinking about other times in history where people who were innovators in their field didn't see what was happening right in front of them. Like this quote from Daryl Zanuck back in 1946, some 70 years ago, about the origins of the television. Television won't be able to hold on to any market it captures after the first six months. People will soon get tired of staring at that plywood box every night. Hmm. Well, he was right about the plywood box. <laughs> I do wonder what he would have thought if somebody put a remote in his hands. But anyway, here's another one. There is no reason that anyone would want a computer in their home. From Ken Olson, again, founded one of the most innovative companies in the history of Massachusetts, Dig Digital Equipment Corporation, was founded right down the road in Maynard, Massachusetts, late 60s, early 70s. But I understand where he was coming from. His first mini computers were the size of a small refrigerator, and they cost about $18,000. So I can understand that he didn't see the connection as to how one of these would end up in every home. But I wonder if there was somebody like Bud in his company, somebody like Bud Sailors, who had an idea about making a smaller computer. And if anybody had said, you should develop that idea, rather than casting it aside. What about this? Who do you think said something like this? It will create forgetfulness in the learners' souls because they will not use their memories. Was this a 21st century teacher talking about the Google searches that his or her students were doing left and right? How about no? This was Socrates in 400 BC talking about writing 
Prior to that point, students internalized everything by just reading things off the page and studying it. But as students started to write, he worried that it would hurt their memories. I think we hear some similar things today about digital reading, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. This whole thing reminds me of the work of Stephen Johnson and where good ideas come from. And I'll let you digest this quote for a minute. Think of the adjacent possible. This is how he describes it. It's a house that magically expands with each door you open. You begin in a room with four doors, each leading to a new room that you haven't visited yet. Once you open one of these doors and stroll into that room, three new doors appear, each leading to a brand new room that you couldn't have reached from your original starting point. As I think about some of the changes that have happened in Burlington going back before 2010, I think about the adjacent possible and some of the access points, some of the doors that we've presented for our students. Some of the times we've said, you should develop that, and some of the things that have happened because of it. You see, back before 2010, when I was the principal of Burlington High School, we didn't allow mobile devices, mobile phones in the building during the school day. We had assistant principals spending their time chasing these devices, calling parents, come pick up this phone. It doesn't belong in school. It's a distraction. But we thought about our mission statement here in Burlington. There's words like creating productive citizens. And our learning expectations talk about teaching students to use current technologies. We can't teach citizenship without talking about digital citizenship. And our, can't, our students can't use current technologies if we're blocking and banning these technologies. So a mindset shift started to happen. And these are some of the pictures that have taken place in the last couple years. But when I think about the adjacent possible, I think about entering a room and giving access to a door and saying, you should develop that, and a student opening, opening the door and the adults in the room not really knowing what's going to come of it. That's exciting to me. Here's an example. This is the best example I can think of. So there's a group of students at Marshall Simons Middle School, and they have this activity block where they work with a 3D printer. They read an article online about the fact that there's places where people are using 3D printers to produce prosthetic hands for people that don't have them. Next comes in our friend from a nearby community, Frankie, who was born without his right hand. You see the picture in the top right-hand corner? That's Frankie's mom holding the prosthetic hand that the health care had provided for her son. Unfortunately, it's this strange contraption Frankie had to put over his shoulder and make some awkward motion to get the claw at the end of the hand to close. Made it very awkward for him to ride a bike and do a lot of the other things that we take for granted. But our middle school students in an activity block, guided by a teacher, two teachers to be exact, who said, you should develop that, not say, wait a minute, you could never do that. They developed a prosthetic hand for Frankie that you can see right down there in the bottom right-hand corner. And they connected, they opened doors, and they connected with a community called Enable Online. That's a community that provides resources for people who have 3D printers and they're trying to provide prosthetic hands for, for people that don't have them. They got pieces of wire sent to them from all parts of the country, little tools that helped them do this work because we provided access to a door and we saw the adjacent possible in action. Here's my other concern, the opposite of the adjacent possible. The problem with closed environments where we don't allow our students to take these opportunities and have access to the tools that can help, help them do things that we, the adults, could never dream of. These closed environments, they make it more difficult to explore the adjacent possible because they reduce the overall network of minds that can potentially engage in a problem. The world our kids are going to is that world where they need access to people that are experts on whatever it is our kids are passionate about. If we are going to provide a relevant, authentic education, 
then we need to provide this type of access. If we say, that wasn't the way I did it when I was in school, if we rely on our old traditions, the way of doing things, we're going to rob our students of a relevant educational experience that is going to help them be competitive in an economy that is changing in ways that we never imagined. Here's a couple of other examples of things that have happened to our students because we've embraced the adjacent possible. The top right hand corner is a story about some of our students from our help desk back in the first year of the Burlington High School Student Help Desk. Because they had an online presence and they were able to connect with folks all over the world, they connected with a group from Great Britain, Quato Studios. Quato Studio Studios was developing a coding app where two robots battled in an arena and the students programmed the robots by entering computer code. Our students were beta testers of that app. And when that app hit the marketplace on iTunes, our students are listed as app developers. Never saw that coming. That's the adjacent possible. Snapchat didn't even exist when we started allowing access to iPads and devices in schools. In fact, most of the adults around here thought it was some weird thing that kids did to send short videos that would disappear forever, or maybe they were even doing inappropriate things. But Thanks to the students in the help desk, we learned how to use Snapchat, the adults in the building. And we found it's a great communication tool. In fact, it's a marketing tool used by corporations. You'll see the NBA's Snapchat logo if you're watching a, a basketball game. It's a marketing tool that we need to know how to use. We need to embrace that possibility. The big left-hand picture here is uh, recently our students were on WBZ TV as one of the innovative things happening in education in the area. Again, the adjacent possible. This would not have happened if we didn't give a doorway that our students could walk through in embracing online learning, social media, technology. If this is all we worry about, we're selling our kids very short. These opportunities, creating a prosthetic hand, creating an app for the App Store. I'm really not sure that th that's going to impact our kids' standardized test scores in a meaningful way. But you know what? I don't care. The experiences that our students have had are much more authentic and will go a lot further for them than what's going to happen on one day when they fill in a bubble sheet. Or maybe they'll take a test online now. I don't really see a big difference. The point is, we've moved from this to this. The signs that are around Burlington High School are much different nowadays and throughout the district. And the fact of the matter is, going back to the possibilities and saying you should develop that allows for things like today to happen. We have a teacher come and say, I want to host a TEDx. You should develop that. I want to end you with this little, I'm going to hold off on the sound. But the iPad band from Burlington High School. During the first year with iPads, a group of students went to their band director, Mr. Lovell, and they said, hey, we want to create a percussion ensemble with the iPads. Mr. Lovell, the band director, said, I have no idea how to do that. He didn't close the door, though. Know what he did? He said, you should develop that. He opened the door to this room the side room down here behind me in the band area. And he left them alone for a couple days. And this is what happened. From the top. after I posted this on YouTube, I got a call from a professor at Kansas State University. He said, how did those students do that? 
can I connect with the band director? I said, you can't connect with the band director. Well, you could, but he doesn't know how they did it. He put them in the room and he let them figure it out. So the interesting thing, about a week later, the leaders of this ensemble had a Skype call with a music teacher from Kansas State University to explain how he could do this with his students. That is the adjacent possible. What we need to do in our schools is we all need to develop a mindset where when somebody comes to us and asks us to do something, our first reaction isn't from our own limited historic knowledge of what happens in schools. We need to pause and we need to start with, you should develop that. Thank you.